Today, America is indisputably the global leader in artificial intelligence, which is why you all are here today. This nation has led the way on AI during its liftoff stage. American companies and institutions have developed the most sophisticated AI models, like ChatGPT, who we hear so much about. American companies, universities, and research institutes are producing the bulk of the cutting-edge research that's pushing forward the frontiers of knowledge in the field. Going forward, maintaining America's edge in AI will be key to our continued national security and economic prosperity. But we can't take that lead for granted. We're now entering a stage of widespread AI adoption, according to business leaders. AI technologies will be integrated broadly into the economy, economy both here and abroad. A large global survey of employers said they're highly likely to adopt AI over the next five years. They expect AI to create a lot of job churn, but to ultimately lead to a 25% net increase in jobs. A 2020 World Economic Forum study found that AI-generated machines could disrupt an estimated 85 million jobs globally by next year. Though that sounds scary and is, the study also suggested that AI adoption could, on the other hand, create as many as 97 million new jobs. AI has to be a tool used to enhance the job, not replace the worker. If done correctly, we can create a new job sector that equitably spreads the benefits of AI to all parts of society while remaining a global technological leader. We are at a critical time with modern AI. Neural networks for machine learning, large language models, LLMs, ML. Uh, this places, as you note, extraordinary demands on our workforce. How do we harness the power of AI while avoiding the pitfalls? How do we stay current with the exceedingly rapid pace of innovation? How do we stay ahead of competitors? That's why HR 4503 that you together have introduced is so vital for the nation. Uh, many have spoken about the potential for modern AI, and I'm very excited about this, so many applications. But for our conversation today, we need to understand the whole picture. And this includes some not so obvious weaknesses and vulnerabilities, the pitfalls. And you've mentioned some of those as well. Uh, we hear about issues of bias and fairness and accuracy. Even with fully correct training data, we can get wrong answers. Machine learning, miscategorizing, LLMs, hallucinating, and we struggle to explain. AI is here. It's redefining work, and it will require more people to work with technology. IBM looks forward to continuing to work with Congress to advance a risk-based approach to regulating AI while ensuring Americans, including the federal workforce, have access to skills training in the era of AI adoption. The truth is that while AI has been around for many years, as we heard from the 50s, uh, interest and concern peaked only recently as its use has become easy for the general public, and they know. Rather than talking about what is AI or how can we develop or regulate AI, I'm going to focus my remarks on how can we develop a workforce pipeline that can use AI to strengthen the U.S. economy. We have very few markers to help us answer this third question. We know that we do not yet have adequate numbers of teachers and faculty to teach AI. We're not sure how we can test students and workers for AI readiness. AI courses in high schools, community colleges, and universities are not organized around national best practice. So we're at the beginning of the adoption curve for this powerful technology, and things are kind of messy. I think sometimes, there, as some of my uh, fellow panelists mentioned, we're not talking uh, across agencies. Maybe we're not talking across industry. Um, it's, I think it's important for the federal government to look at what industry has done and try to implement and use the, the tools that are out there, like our skills build, like the other platforms that are widely available, and start getting those in use sooner. We need a Khan Academy of AI is what we need. <laughs> um, you also mentioned in your testimony that federal contractors are rarely able to place an individual without a four-year degree on a technology services contract, regardless of their qualifications. Are you saying that the terms of the federal contracts IBM is asked to sign prohibit the work be done by those without college degrees? Is that, is that inhibit 
your ability to fill those roles? Yes, it is an issue, and let me explain. Um, in my experience with federal contracts, a lot of times you have labor category descriptions and requirements that say, if you have a cybersecurity analyst, these are the minimum qualifications that they must meet. Um, in some cases, we've seen change. So there, it's not um, that the, the regulations are not being implemented, but it's just not enough. So um, as an example, that cybersecurity analyst, it may say as an entry level, you need a bachelor's degree plus one year of experience, or it might say bachelor's degree, or you can substitute four years of experience. But our cybersecurity apprenticeship program is a six month curriculum. Those people don't have four years of experience, but they're immersed in six months and they're ready to hit the ground running on those programs. And because they don't meet that minimum qualification, we are not able to put them on that contract. But, um, mm -hmm. They might even be more qualified than someone with a four-year degree um, because they put that skill set into practice. Um, I'm going to move on as I'm running out of time, and I apologize. Uh, Dr. Sherless, my last question today is uh, Carnegie Mellon, Mellon and other leading universities now offer a variety of AI-related education options, including traditional degrees, boot camps, certifications, et cetera. Are there effective alternatives to traditional undergraduate and graduate degrees that will be instrumental in preparing the American workforce to be AI ready? What do you advise? Thank you for that question. I mentioned one example, which is working directly with uh, the workforce. Uh, in this case, um, uh, it, was, it was in the, related to hotels and uh, uh, transit workers right, and working directly with the workers and their employers so that when the uh, employers are building AI systems, they can craft those systems in a way that aligns well with the workers' experience and knowledge and how the workers can evolve in those roles. So that's one example of, of Thank direct you. outreach. Thank, Thank you so much. It's taken at least eight years to develop a typology for cybersecurity skills development. We also have several agencies, each of which promote their own type of, of uh, typology. As a consequence, I think it's vital with AI, since it's, we're still in the beginning, to jump first and to insist that there be some kind of a mechanism that defines what are the skills, how do you prove that you have those skills, and how do they mesh to job requirement. That's the last thing I said when I talked about industry. It's very difficult sometimes for an academic institution to hear what industry needs. Yeah. So, Sometimes it gets lost in translation, so therefore surrogates come in. Do you have a bachelor's degree? Okay, good. You're good to go. That should not be the case. Yeah. It should be the case that we line to specific skills and specific preparations. That's what's needed uh, in standardizing. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Sherless, you were at um, DARPA. Uh, you've sort of been at the beginning of this, uh, well, beginning of this explosion of this fascination with AI, what keeps you up at night? What, what makes you, what, what worries you about where we could go with AI? So I have, I have a concern uh, regarding the various pitfalls that I mentioned in my st uh, statement and, and uh, elaborated in some detail in the written statement. Um, my concern is, is not about those pitfalls, but my concern is rather that those who are, because the AI applications are so compelling and so transformative, not just enhancing productivity, but creating new ways of doing business, that we get so enamored of those that we, are, we don't have that awareness of what the pitfalls are and we get stuck and we get surprised. And that's one of the characteristics, in fact, of the world of cybersecurity, is that we, we build systems, we can measure what the system does and how long it takes to build that system and how much it costs. We can't easily measure how secure it is. And, and so we let security uh, 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 attributes kind of evolve and unfold over time. So that's a, a significant challenge, and I think that part of this AI education uh, and training process is to help people be aware of the various pitfalls, the weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and also the mitigations, the various techniques that we can use as we engineer systems and as we place systems into workplace contexts uh, to use those systems safely. Mm. Yeah, but sometimes though, I've seen it in cyber. Uh, I've, I've looked at cyber protection programs, but they also train people in cyber techniques we would prefer they not be trained in. But to protect, you have to, but it can be used for good and bad once you've trained somebody. Right, actually I just want to make one more point, which is uh, 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 the point about measurement of 
uh, cybersecurity risk, the point about measurement of similarly AI risk, uh, uh, educational outcomes. These are all hugely challenging research questions as we think about putting programs in place I think it's important to think also about what kind of research we can do to measure and assess outcomes both for the systems and also for the people who are entangled with those systems, recognizing how fast the technology is evolving. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that human nature generally is going to facilitate increased usage of AI? I mean, it, it, if it can make it easier for you, might as well try to use it. A lot of people out there have tasks that they don't want to do in their job uh, and in their lives, and if you can press the easy button, you're, you're likely going to do it. So is it a lot of it's awareness in, the, in that respect? Is that fair? Well, that's, that's uh, 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 why awareness of the AI pitfalls is so important, because if we make it very easy to uh, adopt AI for purposes for which it may not be well matched, then all of those problems of bias and fairness and vulnerability to adversarial attacks, all of those bubble up. So the adoption process, on the one hand, should be attentive to the potential to not just improve productivity, but to create new capabilities on the one hand, but on the other hand, to do that in a way where we are attentive and alert to the risks and, and safety issues. And I guess I want to talk about those risks. Dr. Torgas, you mentioned this. Um, if you use ChatGPT and you ask a question, um, and then you say, answer that question if you're in Saudi Arabia or if you're in Yemen, it's actually quite different. Um, certain words are entirely gone. Um, the word that they use is ethics instead of equity, instead of DEI, it actually is culturally uh, different. So, I mean, how do we have this conversation in a productive way without kind of imposing our cultural values on uh, the planet? Is that, does that question make sense? If, if your biggest concern is equity and um, your view of, of equity and your values are very dissimilar from other uh, cultures that are also going to be using AI, how do you reconcile that? How do you deal with that? Uh, thank you for that question. It has no simple answer, alas. Uh, I would say that uh, um, the very technology of AI includes a session where AI learns, you kind of stuff the machine with things before you even use it. What you stuff the machine with is vital. And um, many different uh, uh, countries are beginning to use AI by including and incorporating training regimens that reflect their own values. So their AI is different from our AI. There is no independent AI. So as a consequence, I think ultimately as a society, we're going to have to learn to uh, reflect in what we expect of AI, our own values. I mean, I, I founded a charter school in Massachusetts, and uh, while we might have 90 applicants for a teaching position in English, we might have 11 applicants for a, a, a similar position in math and science. And so what's happening is, especially in the Boston area, uh, and it's happening everywhere, I'm sure, is private industry is scooping up anybody with, with a certain uh, talent or skill, skill set. How do, we, how do we get at that problem where we, we actually create the teachers who will be able to sort of multiply the effort uh, and, and uh, help us uh, either, either catch up to some of the countries that seem to have uh, taken uh, a lead in this or, uh, or actually maintain our our, um, our edge. Uh, Dr. Torregas? Uh, thanks again for that question. I think experimentation and boldness are the keys. Uh, in my own university of George Washington, uh, the National Science Foundation and NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology, has provided a grant to develop a, a comprehensive way to look at law and society. It's called uh, Trustworthy AI in Law and Society. The key there is the combination of different disciplines which can inspire teachers to want to become involved in it. A second simple example is the networking of, of professionals together. Uh, National Science Foundation, again, uh, bravo to the National Science Foundation, has funded uh, something called the National Center for Tr Training and Education in Cybersecurity. Uh, they uh, assemble more than 300 universities and community colleges. They develop common curricula, and they help faculty careers. 
The same model can be used in the AI, AI field. I'll give opportunity for each of you to elaborate on what careers or jobs that are going to be, the, what, what is the range that you see happening and what's the one that's most in demand? Um, thanks for the question. Again, this is why I emphasize the importance of typology. How do we describe jobs in the AI field? We've already heard that there's, there, there are jobs like, uh, how do you shape a question? That's become a job now. How do you shape a question for chat GPT? Um, there's, there's also the computer science behind it. How do you make better AI machinery? Um, uh, my kind of North Star would be to make sure that we develop uh, a faculty, because that's the key, the key area is faculty. If we don't have faculty at the high school level and the community college and university level, we will lose the battle 10 years from now because they're being diverted in other fields and we desperately need educators. So that's where the, the focus has to be. Thank you for the, the, for the question. And in addition to the roles that, that he just mentioned, I think it's really important to think about AI is going to change 90% of jobs, right? So we need to think about how um, one of the members mentioned around uh, freeing people up from redundant tasks that you may not want, that's not the most exciting part of our work. Um, we've done this at the VBA, where we, uh, the Veterans Benefits Administration, I mentioned in my written testimony that we used AI and automation to help them process a lot of the, the information that comes in. Increasing that process time and freeing those overworked VBA employees up to do more higher value work for, uh, for the veteran. So I think it's really important that as we're uh, considering the era of AI adoption, how we help each, each employee, each federal worker think about um, how their job can change, maybe what their job is going, what they can free up to do. And, um, and then if their jobs... Um, Without feeling that their job is threatened. Yeah, it's, it's, I absolutely acknowledge the uncertainty, but if we have transparency about more jobs are being created, jobs are being uh, uh, elevated in our HR function, as an example, in IBM, when we've done a lot of this uh, reskilling already, most of the people in our HR job function are now one job band higher because we have use uh, AI to yeah. automate some of the to work. To ma magnify productivity. Exactly. Dr. Sherless, what are a few major initiatives we can undertake uh, to create more uh, equality of opportunity when it comes to digital wealth generation? I think that starting early is essential. Um, and that's one of the reasons why at Carnegie Mellon we focus so closely on K through 12 programs, outreach programs. Um, one, we get to people early uh, so they can become kind of acculturated with the new technologies, first computer science and now AI. Um, and then that also puts them into a state of improved readiness so that they can participate, for example, in our degree programs uh, with strong backgrounds. Um, in the early days of computer science undergraduate degrees, we reached out to K through 12 for exactly this purpose, to improve the applicant pool for our programs so that we could operate those programs at a high level. So I think that's starting early is, is, is the most important lever we can push. How does IBM approach the process of retraining and upskilling existing employees? Thank you for that question. Investing in upskilling, reskilling, and lifelong learning is just in IBM's DNA. And as we usher in new technologies like AI, um, we must ensure that both our employees and our society more broadly have opportunities to gain these skills. And we do this in real time. Uh, we want our employees to remain valuable to our clients, so we employ reskilling and upskilling uh, programs annually. Uh, I mentioned in my testimony that we require a minimum of 40 hours of education, um, learning annually for every employee. Um, an example of where, we've, um, where we see employees' jobs that are being affected by AI, uh, we're reskilling and being transparent about what their next path could be. Uh, all of our job roles in IBM uh, have an associated learning path that shows you what 
uh, continuous learning you need to do to stay on your current role and progress in your current role or progress out of your role. I have this visual here. I didn't come up with this. I thought it was a really neat visual created by Opportunity at Work. And it talks about something called the paper ceiling. And it's defined as the invisible barrier that comes at every turn for the 70 million workers who are stars. Now you might be wondering what is a star? They define a star as a person skilled through alternative routes other than college, four-year college. I want to focus for a moment on these automated, automated hiring systems because they are ubiquitous. Most large employers use them. And apparently, according to 90% of employers in a recent study, they, they felt that because of those automated hiring systems, they are screening out precisely those stars who could otherwise do the job. And so uh, because of that, um, we have introduced legislation called the Opportunity to Compete Act, H.R. 5960, to quote-unquote tear the paper ceiling and prevent automated discrimination against applicants without bachelor's degrees so that these stars could flourish. What's your opinion of that, Ms. Hadra? Well, as I mentioned in my written and oral testimony, 50% of our job postings at IBM in the U.S. do not require a college degree anymore. So we are definitely moving to a skills-first perspective, and we encourage that adoption in the federal government as well. And what is the barrier to adopting that, that skills-first mindset among your peers? I think it's really uh, getting the demands of the learning institutions and industry together to, um, to help identify which roles can be more uh, apprentice, like we're saying, AI, cybersecurity. Um, there's a shortcoming in the workforce system around uh, these requirements. So I think a lot of it's con you know, um, dialogue. And I think if we'd be happy to have a follow-on conversation with you because we are very passionate about the success of our skills-based hiring program. Well, we would love to see more people talk about this legislation and the need to allow people who can do the job to be able to prove they can without presenting a diploma to prove they can. Thank you, and uh, we properly filibustered for you, Mr. Byer, this afternoon, and, and Mr. <laughs> Christian Morthy, we use AI in our office, quick, just quick write-up stuff, so I think we should, should not ban it. <laughs> Helps our comms teams. Good. Mr. Byer, you're now recognized, if you're ready, Madam for five Chairman, minutes. Thank you so much for filibustering for me. I don't want to make it a habit on this side of the Capitol, though. Um, but thank you. Um, Dr. Shirless, in your testimony, you spoke about explainability, transparency, bias, fairness, accuracy, and reliability of the AI models. Uh, just last month, we introduced a bill called the AI Foundation Model Transparency Act to try to address the issue and shed some light into the black box of AI Foundation models. Um, my bill would call for the model deployer to make certain information about the training data how the model is trained publicly available. Users, the hope is that users should know why the model is giving certain results so it's not used in a discriminatory way. So the question, Dr. Sherlis, is do you think this type of transparency effort would support the federal government's existing workforce with evaluating AI models? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think there, there's tremendous challenges with the AI foundation models, and in fact, some of the inventors of those models have stated openly that they themselves don't fully understand how those models come to certain conclusions and outputs. Uh, there's a, a challenge because within a large language model, you can have hundreds of billions of parameters that are all adjusted as it goes through its learning process. So to understand what goes on inside of one of those models is like doing brain surgery on a person as a way to uncover what their opinions might be on various issues. It's, it's a frightening, frighteningly difficult challenge. And so from a research perspective, uh, explainable AI is a very significant problem. Uh, it, and there are many possible solutions and a lot of discussion and uh, disagreements within the AI research community. Um, there's another pitfall, which is because these models are fundamentally statistical in nature, they're like predictive statistics, even if I train it on 100% correct training cases, I can still get hallucinations coming out, um, certainly with the current systems. And so that's, that's because 
the statistical nature kind of lumps similar things into, into buckets. The, the distinctions go away in that learning process. So uh, there are lots of actions that AI people are taking to mitigate this problem, to make the outputs a little bit more accurate. But to get to 100% pure accuracy with full explanations, that's, I think, still in the, in the future. Yeah, we participated in a red teaming exercise late last week that Congressman Jay Obernolte put together. And uh, they told me that they could get up to an 80% on a, uh, a AP calculus test. And uh, I found a couple of people there that got a 100% um, without using AI. So. There's no further business without objection. The, the subcommittee stands adjourned.